Hello again, and welcome to my new video series. Uh, this is all a bit of an accident. I sort of bought this on eBay in a moment of madness. Um, so I'm, we're going to start a new project, along with all the other projects I've got going at the same time. Uh, this is a, a little rolling road that I bought. Um, I bought it on eBay, as I've already said, um, but I thought I would take you on a little journey because rolling roads are quite heavy and they're quite noisy so I need to be able to move it around so I can take it to places where I can run it. I want to be able to chew my own cars so I thought this was ideal really. Now we're just going to have a little look at what crock of joy I've bought and then uh, and this will span out into many videos I'm sure of Tinker Town. I've been looking at dinos for a few years, uh, but recently I found a guy on YouTube um, who's got an Instagram account called What Power, uh, and he's got a YouTube series which I'll pin a link up here somewhere, uh, a card, whatever they call it, where he found a, an old rolling road from like the 70s that had been abandoned in a scrap place, and then he fully refurbished it, put all new bearings on it, and he turned it into a trailer. And it's got like some triumph thing with a savage engine in it. And it, there's a whole YouTube series in there. So if this sort of stuff interests you, you should watch his videos. He is a really cool guy. Um, but yeah, he he's part of the inspiration behind me not just looking at these things, but going, oh, I think I'm going to buy one. And I think I'm going to do this silly idea. So just a big up to uh, Mr. Watt Power. And uh, I've forgotten what your YouTube channel's called, but I'll say, I'll put a link up here. It's ca It came out of a university or a college. Um, it doesn't appear to be used very much because the knurling, you know, this is painted red and there's still red here. So, you know, it can't have done very much. We can see a bit of a tyre mark that's been run there. And the knurling is still sharp. And the little traps i think these are the idea is if you you can't wander off the roller because the tire catches them but they still have paint on so as typical with all colleges and universities they buy very expensive things and then do fa with them so it's here and uh yeah the, so the knurling's all pretty good it's obviously been stored and it's all quite dirty so we'll get the aluminium cleaner and stuff on it and get all of that alloy cleaned up. This is a braked roller, a braked dyno. So it's not an inertia dyno. It's not like a, a dyno jet joke. It's a braked one. So we can do steady, steady state tuning on it. And I'll try and not chop my fingers off. It's got a proper Talmar branded retarder on it, which seems to have um, eight coils on each side. I don't really know much about all of this gear. Uh, and then, I was looking through product literature and uh, I was looking at it and I found out that it's made by a company called Dynastar in Holland. And on the Wayback Machine, I actually found this rolling road and it looks like they sold it before 2008. Um, and it seems to be a MRC 500 mobile roller chassis. Um, so that you can apparently move it around with a forklift truck is the idea that it's got two points underneath that you can slip a set of forks and move it. And, uh, and you don't need to bolt it down, apparently. It seems to be rated for tuning cars up to 250 horsepower static and up to 350 horsepower dynamic, whatever that means. And the brake on it is rated for 800 newton meters. Um, it tells us a bit about the max roller speed, 250 kilometers an hour. Um, it tells us the size of the rollers. Uh, it tells us the inertia of the rollers, which could be quite handy. Um, it also tells us that apparently it weighs 325 kilos, but we're gonna find that out in a minute. So the idea is I'm going to attach some sort of axle. Uh, we need some sort of tow coupling maybe this end maybe that end probably more tempted to put it at this end for the tow frame than the axles there 
But the idea is I'm going to pick it up. We're going to weigh it to make sure that their weights on their piece of paper are accurate. We need to find the centre of gravity because then we can know where to put the axle. Because if this balanced on an axle, it'd be very easy to move around. We're going to take the covers off it. We're going to have a look at what we've got and, uh, and, and see where this journey takes us. So, all right, let's get the cover off it anyway and we'll see what's underneath. Let's pop the hood. Right, so the cover is off. So we have, obviously, two sets of rollers. We've got the driven roller that's attached to the Telmar, and we've got a pair of idler rollers. Um, we've got some big bearing blocks, which are all made by SKF. Um, I've had a look at those already. We've got some sort of crush drive, which I'm sure is just to take a, a tap, detach one from the other a little bit to take a bit of side loading out. Now we have this RPM sensor, or the Finger Chopper 2000. This is an opto sensor, so one side's got like an LED of some sort, and the other one's got like a, a light sensitive diode, so it's like an opto couple. So once those four teeth go through, it counts the rotation speed with the pulses. This might need upgrading. I might need to cut some more divots in it. Like it might need more teeth to accurately calculate the rate of acceleration of the roller, but we'll see what happens with that. Um, the Telmar, don't really know much about Telmars, don't really know much about anything really. Um, but it is what it is. And this has got down there a strain gauge. Let's see if we can focus on that. So that measures the strain that the Telmar is opposing. So as we apply a load, it's going to measure the torque by how, because this is this Telmar is free hanging and that is what stops the the outer side of it from rotating so it's like the opposing force that's how we measure torque um, and in here we have a little box of tricks let me just open this up right then the little patch panel so we've got some connectors that come out the bottom so first of all it's 240 volts so I can just plug it into the mains there is a plug socket here so it's just normal UK power. And then it has, so it only has two cables really. One to plug it in, and then this cable, which is supposed to go to the um, dyno acquisition system, the, the DAC, whatever you want to call it. All right, so this is upside down, but that's just how it is. All the electrons are gonna fall out, as Davy Jones would say. Um, we've got this Semicron phase controller which is this big box. Then we've got a little diode unit thing here. Um, and I've seen these on the um, on schematics. This, you apply a zero to five volt signal here, and that generates the opposing magnetic force. So it it creates some sort of phase, some, some phases, some, some waveforms, which makes a magnetic field that creates the eddy currents that create the load. You can tell I really know what I'm on about. So really, all we need to do is come up with a way to attach this to the MyDyno control box. And in here, there really is only three things connected to this in all of these pins. Uh, and it goes to that little connector there. We've got three wires that are going to our RPM sensor over there. So that'll have like five volts ground and a signal wire for the pulse. We've got four wires in here that go to the strain gauge. And then we've got two wires that go to the phase controller. And that is pretty much all she wrote. So that can't be too complicated to get the my dyno thing hooked up to that. What I do need to do is find out the name of this connector. So, because I might as well use all of this, this all looks pretty good quality. So we'll um, we'll make another box that this just plugs into. Um, 
Right. Anyway, let's pick this up at both ends and weigh it and see if it meets the weight that it says on the sheet. So that side is 277.8. So the light end says 175.50, 175.5 kilos. Right, so we know at one end it's 175 and we know the other end it's 278. So if we add them together, we end up with 453 kilos, which for a sanity check, they claim this to weigh. 325 kilos. Um, am I doing something stupid here? I just, I just also want to be clear that part of the reason why I'm doing this as a video series, because I'm hoping the people in the comments below are going to guide me a little bit. Like, I want sound... This is like a hive mind. Now, my thoughts are here... If I measure this, the weight of this at one end and the weight of this at the other end, if you add both up, it should be the weight of the car. It's like corner weighting a car. You put the scales under all four tyres, you add the weights up and you know how heavy it is. This is the same. Now, somehow it is 100 kilos heavier than what the company claim it to be, but I'm not so sure that my data sheet is for the right piece of equipment. I'm going to email Dynastar and see if this is what I think it is because it could turn out that the Telmar's a bigger one or something. Um, and that is a heavy bit. So anyway, I've weighed both ends, and then I've measured the distance between where I've weighed. Yeah, And we know that my distance between my measuring points is 2470. Um, I used a centre of mass calculator, and, and this has got to be pretty simple maths at the end of the day, because it's like it's like a simply supported beam You've got the weight on at one end, you've got the mass on at each end, and then it's going to be like a ratio between the pair will tell you where the centre of mass is. And it says it's at 168.15 centimetres. So, I have drawn a little line on that roller there. Now, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some chocks of wood underneath it and lower it onto this centre point and we'll see if this thing just balances quite nicely. Right then, I'm not a clever man, so we need simple ways to prove simple concepts. Now, I've got the pieces of wood where the, where the pencil line should be. It's now no longer sitting on there, but it is sitting on the front. Now, let's just see if I am anywhere near the balancing point. 46 kilos off, I am. 46 kilos. The mass might assume that the item has a continuous mass from one end to the other, but because this has rollers and then space and then rollers and then the Telmar, it isn't an evenly distributed mass. So you'd probably have to weigh it in more places to, to calculate, it, calculate it properly. But I think that gave us a pretty good ballpark to start from. So we know it's real centre of gravity is literally where these bolt holes are here. Yeah? Now if we just slip that over, still on it. By chance, it is exactly where I've put my uh, put my strap. And what I thought I'd do is because we're going to put we're, we're literally dropping the rollers on that chock right now, so it could wander on and off the chock. It'd be like a rolling pin. Now, if I put a figure of eight and attach them to each other, now they want to roll. They'll roll freely inwards like that, yeah. But they can't roll at the same speed. So when I put them down in the same direction. Anyway, this should balance now. I'd be pretty confident that'll balance. 
Pretty dangerous. Right, pick that back up. There's some handy things here. So there's this beefy piece of chassis. This box section is savage. What? It's like four mil or something. Three point five mil box section. Let's get a vernier. Three point five mil. Thought about as much. It's pretty heavy box section that is. So we need to come up with a way to attach a trailer coupling at this end, um, which can't be too hard. I'm not so sure trying to twist that round is a good idea because when you put the arm, it's going to try and... So I think we'll come off here with some sort of triangulation because we need a bit of triangulation anyway. Um, we'll maybe make it so it slips in the holes and then some bolts through or something. So it could have a couple of bolts and then a couple of bolts, something like that, I don't know. And then... Because the centre of gravity is here, if we attach some sort of axle to at this point of the chassis here, the indispension units always hang downwards. They've always got a pivot. So we'll end up with the wheels roughly where the centre of gravity is. If it's slightly more forward, it's okay, because we're going to add more mass at the front with the coupling. So, And really, number one priority in this right now is stop this from being immobile once i can move it about it's not consuming my workshop so let's just go and have a quick look on the computer at what we can buy you get two in dispension units um the plates that bolt them onto the chassis as well some bolts uh, a tongue a, a coupling you know some wheels and tires and that's rated for 750 kilos and in the uk if your trailer is under 750 kilos, you don't need brakes. So I think we'll go with that lot. And the height of it, we can always space this game up. As long as we weld these plates on, we can then jack these plates up with some, some collars or some shims in between it. So we'll come up with something anyway. So I think what we'll do is we'll buy that and then that'll get it mobile. So there's this guy i think he's in norway yourdino.com and he's making all of this like dino data acquisition gear um, i'm guessing that might be him and his buddy um, i think they're in norway here you go company in nesbru close to oslo in norway and you know the norwegians are cool people like th there isn't anything more cool than a scandinavian Maybe a Dutch person. They might be cooler than a Scandinavian. Mm, it's borderline. They're all cool, aren't they, up there, anyway? We've got tabs. We could even do it as a kit, and then we could actually buy their their power supply and their RPM centre and all that sort of stuff. But I think, just because... And also, that's on back order at the moment. Um, I think I'll just buy the digital acquisition unit, the DAC, um, which... I'm having it with can because we want can because then we can we can bring in other data from data loggers and sensors and off the car and stuff uh, and it's really good being able to read the engine rpm properly via can anyway i'll leave this at this stage and uh tell me what you think if there's any suggestions and comments and uh, ideas I th put them right away give me your feedback because i i haven't really got a clue what i'm doing and um i'd value other people's opinion on this and uh right so anyway thank you very much thanks for watching and i hope you enjoy this project bye